Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and today we continue our How to Survive series. So far we've looked at the Battle of Moncala, the Battle of Mimbam, and the Battle of Endor. Now we'll be continuing with the battle you guys requested, the Battle of Umbara. Just a reminder before we start, this video is not about being a hero or even being honorable. This is a video about being practical and preserving one's life above all else, even if that means being a coward. Because we care about all you troopers out there and we don't really need any heroes just yet. Leave that kind of stuff up to the guys with the plot armor. Now this video will be broken up into four segments. First we'll discuss the planet the battle takes place on, then the combatants you'll be facing. We'll also go over the equipment and training you need to bring with you, along with what you actually need to do during the battle to survive. Umbara was located in the expansion region of the galaxy, nicknamed the Shadow World because sunlight rarely ever made it to the surface of the planet, partly due to its thick but breathable atmosphere, partly due to its perilous location within the Ghost Nebula. For most of galactic history, Umbara remained cut off and hidden from the rest of the galaxy. Piling through a nebula wasn't exactly the safest thing to do, but according to legends, Umbara had been with the Old Republic since the very beginning of galactic history, although it did occasionally switch to the Sith Empire during one of the many conflicts between the Jedi and the Sith. Although the planet of the surface remained unexposed to the sunlight, it was still teeming with strange and exotic light forms. The majority of the planet was made up of rolling hills which were covered in overgrown massive fauna. This included a lot of bioluminescent plants and also terrifying carnivorous plants like the tentacled Vixus. There were also a wide range of different predators that were at the top of this very complicated bioluminescent food chain. These were animals like the gladiopod, mantor, slybex, skirus, vixen mauler, and the always annoying banshees. And of course, all of these predatory animals have evolved to be extremely good at hunting in low light situations. As far as resources go, Umbara was rich with dunium, a high strength metal that was commonly used in the construction of starships and space stations. The Death Star super weapon required a massive amount of dunium for its design. On the shadow planets, we find the lovely shadow people known as the Umbarns. These pasty near-human aliens were quite similar to humans, except for a few slight distinctions. One was their palest complexion, light-colored hair and eyes. Then there was their ability to see in the ultraviolet spectrum, which they evolved thanks to the dark conditions on their planet. This also meant that their eyes were extremely sensitive to bright light. Now, the Umbarns evolved as a very closed-off society, and some might say xenophobic. The Umbarns had a very rigid, nuanced caste system that had almost a hundred different levels. Mobility within the caste system was encouraged, but it usually involved blackmailing or political maneuvering or even assassinations. If the perpetrator was caught in a failed plot to ascend the ranks, they could be arrested and their entire family could drop in the caste system along with them. So with great risk comes great reward, and it created a very meritocratic and vicious society. Only members of the top 10 cast levels on Umbara were allowed to actually venture off the planet, which is why Umbarans were rarely ever seen in the wider galaxy. And the ones that did travel were usually quite accomplished and wealthy, having made it through their Hunger Games-like caste system. Umbarans were therefore known by the wider galaxy for their ruthlessness and cunning and their ability to read other people's emotions and thoughts. Those who made it off of Umbar and weren't representing the Umbaran people served usually as political advisors, businessmen, and even assassins. After the assassination of Umbaran Senator Medici on Coruscant, the Umbarans withdrew from the Republic and aligned themselves with the Separatist Alliance. The Umbaran militia was the Umbaran's main fighting force. It was completely supplied with Umbaran technology. Thanks to their isolation from the rest of the galaxy, the Umbarans were able to independently develop their own technology, separate from the rest of the Galactic Republic. So expect to see weapons and vehicles that you may have never seen before. The average Umbaran militiaman was equipped with an armored bodysuit pumped with a gas cocktail of combat enhancement drugs, which were injected directly into the respiratory system. For some odd reason, when their face visors were shattered, it resulted in them suffocating despite the fact that Umbara had a Type 1 breathable atmosphere. The Umbara militia also used special blaster rifles that fired a high-powered plasma projectile. They also carried miniature anti-personnel droids that could shock and stun enemy soldiers. 
For vehicular support, the Umbarns relied on the Umbarn hover tank, which fired electromagnetic plasma projectiles that could take out entire patrols with just one shot. Then there was the heavily shielded impending assault tank, which was shaped like a centipede and was bristling with weapons and placements. The largest ground vehicle that the Umbarns used was their mobile heavy cannon, shaped like a giant spider walker. These behemoths were impossible to take down without heavy artillery. For air support, the Umbarn fighter was a VTOL aircraft that was equipped with heavy plasma cannons and missile pods. The entire cockpit of the fighter was made of ray shields, and all Umbarn vehicles used a unique touch-activated virtual control scheme. Generally speaking, Umbarn technology was usually one generation ahead of whatever the Galactic Republic had. But most of the Umbarn vehicles and weapons could be defeated by the clones' conventional combined arms tactics. Although, at least initially, the clones were at a severe disadvantage because they had never seen weapons like the ones the Umbarns were using. Once again, you're going to find yourself in a low light and minimal visibility situation. This is not only because there's no sunlight on the planet, there is also a lot of fog and moisture in the air. The Umbarns can see in the UV spectrum, I recommend you try to do the same. The Umbarns mainly fought like a guerrilla force and used asymmetric warfare tactics and really enjoyed ambushing enemy forces. They knew the terrain and could move around and see much better than the clones. Their tactics were meant to chip away at the enemy's morale and resources while exposing themselves to limited casualties. It's a good idea to practice more flexible patrol formations that will allow your unit to better respond to ambushes. You can also further enhance your detection abilities by using droids and drones to scan out the terrain in front of you. And remember, it's not just the Umbarns you have to worry about. There are plenty of other natural things on Umbara that can kill you as well. Also, make sure to activate your IFF so that even in the murky darkness, you can tell where your fellow troopers are. This can prevent friendly fire incidents and can also keep you from getting lost. As far as weapons go, I recommend you supplement your platoon's firepower with some anti-vehicle weapons. Many of the Embarn ground vehicles are actually shielded, which means your average detonator or small arms fire might not be enough to take out the enemy. Also, make sure to ditch the white clone trooper armor for something a bit less reflective if you can get some kind of material that can hide your body's heat signature, that can be quite helpful as well. Also, remember the Embarns are very sensitive to bright light, which means that flashbangs and flares can completely throw off their attack against you and can be very useful to regain the initiative during an ambush. Now, during the initial invasion and landing on Umbara's surface, General Anakin Skywalker was in charge of the 501st assault. Their job was to approach the Umbaran capital city from the north, while Obi-Wan Kenobi's 212th would approach the city from the south. Skywalker is a pretty careless Jedi, very capable and inspirational, but his dive headfirst into the enemy mentality usually ended up causing heavy casualties for the clone army. The invasion of Umbara's surface was no different. Anakin decides to directly attack the Umbaran forces defending the northern approach with a massive assault using LAAT gunships carrying recon walkers. Using the ATRT platform speed, Anakin mounts what essentially is an old school cavalry charge against heavily fortified Umbaran tanks and infantry positions. Again, like the Battle of Mimbaum, always avoid being at the front of a mass wave attack across open ground against fortified enemies. If you do happen to be on an ATRT, crash and make it look like it hurt. The 501st are successful in their initial assault and establish a landing zone for the rest of their troops, but things get even worse now as Anakin Skywalker is recalled from the battlefield and replaced by the Jedi General Pon Krell. Now, Anakin will get you killed, but he's not doing it on purpose. Pon Krell, on the other hand, will purposely try to get you killed and is secretly working for the Confederacy. Krell continuously leads the 501st into enemy traps and has them assault fortified positions. He even starts a deadly friendly fire incident between the 501st and the 212th. It becomes pretty clear very quickly that Pong Krell is actively trying to get clones killed. Your first and foremost priority now is to step up and confront Krell and relieve him of duty. Of course, gather as many clones as possible. Krell has four arms and was a Jedi. There is no way you'll be able to take him down one on one. Or better yet, if you are engaged in combat, just shoot him in the back of the head. I'm sure your fellow clone brothers won't mind. The last thing you need is a leader who's actively trying to kill you. With Pong Krell gone, the pathway to the Umbaran capital is clear. Continue using loose patrol formations. Remember all those counter ambush drills you learned in basic. Rely on your technology to scout the terrain ahead of you. And remember, don't fall into any traps or pursue the enemy too far away from your own main force. 
The environs don't have a large militia, so they're going to want to isolate and split apart your unit and destroy you piece by piece. If you do encounter pockets of environ resistance with heavy armor, call in air support and fire support. The fighting on Umbara will be rough and tough, but if you use caution, maintain good squad communication and spacing, survival is definitely possible. So there you have it guys, that is what I recommend you do in order to survive the Battle of Umbara. There's no shame in falling down and pretending you sprained your ankle in the middle of a firefight to save your life. Anyway guys, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. My name is Alan, if you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.